Thank you all for being here. It, it, it is also an honor for me um, to be here. Last night in the uh, keynote address, we were reminded by the wise Professor Quintman that politics and religion are inextricable. Although last night that insight was applied to Taranatha, such a balanced critical view might also be applied to the scholar who was lauded and compared to Taranatha by Professor Quintman, His Excellency Signor Tucci, who perhaps like us today was blessed and cursed to live through and actively participate in interesting times. Much more could be said to balance the account, but we are here, or I am here, to celebrate the art Tucci acquired, not the circumstances by which we are privileged to have access to that art. I'm here to discuss one aspect of the paintings upstairs, the sponsors whose images are often depicted at the bottom of the paintings. We see these donors as they wished to be seen, as pious and humble, and with connections to the deity. But we can also apply Professor Quintman's reminder of the inextricability of religion and politics as also applying to them. They were human actors with complicated lives, longings, pressures, and responses. In his typically typically eloquent writing, Tucci sums up the two main points of my presentation today. First, the connection between Tibetan images uh, of sponsor figures and Indian examples of uh, representations of sponsor figures. And second, the poignancy of these two-dimensional remainders of long-forgotten but no less originally real three-dimensional lives. Writing about the paintings he acquired in the Western Himalayas and Tibet, Giuseppe Tusci observed, and I quote, in the most ancient paintings on cloth, which closely follow the prescriptions of the Indian Pata paintings, the donor image is not la- or the donor's image is not lacking. He is represented with his family and the officiating lamas. Almost an echo of life thus reaches these paintings and speaks with the voice of human desires, end quote. So let us attend to a few of these echoes of the lives of the donors and the officiating lamas. And that's what I um, plan to, to do. Um, this example uh, upstairs uh, of the green Tara in, in central Tibet uh, is a, a somewhat um, uh, paradigmatic example of a uh, sponsor figure at the bottom, placed you know, very humbly. Uh, people who are seated, the female on the left, on your left, um, is making Anjali Mudra, or mudra uh, a gesture of, of reverence. Um, they're often kneeling or seated. And uh, the male figure, presumably the husband, and as we'll see, many of these feature couples, um, the husband is holding some sort of a brazier or incense um, burner, uh, and uh, he's next to, uh, as, as, as you'll see when you uh, look at the actual example, uh, next to a, a table or an altar of offerings that are made uh, to, the, uh, to the 21 Taras here. Um, and, and they're dressed uh, in their Sunday best, if you will, no doubt, um, and in ways that um, can help in the reconstruction of, of uh, garments. Uh, it's much more likely that we can uh, determine what people wore, um, both in India and in um, in in Tibet from the donor figures rather than from um, the main deities, which uh, all too often is used as as an index. There we go. Here's another um, example. And um, I'm I'm happy to say that the uh, the group of paintings up there includes uh, a number of examples where uh, the sponsor figure uh, is is a female. Uh, Women were actively involved in the sponsorship of paintings, at at least in in terms of being represented as the sponsors. So here we see um, a female sponsor uh, and um, and one of the uh, officiating lamas. Uh, 
Uh, and so what is he uh, officiating at? Um, perhaps an offering um, to the deity, but also um, uh, it's not unlikely that what is actually happening here or what is represented here is a, uh, uh, a consecration of the object itself. And that, of course, includes making offerings. But we see the lay sponsor um, kneeling and offering a flower, and then uh, next to him, next to her, sorry, is a, um, is a monastic figure who is also offering a flower and may actually be involved. We'll see an example of an inscription that um, is uh, written by a, uh, a monk, uh, but mentions that uh, the, the benefits for this offering should go to his whole family, and member, lay members of his family are also included there. So this may be um, uh, both the officiating lama and the sponsor, and then his sister, mother, uh, some relative, or it may be that the, that the female uh, sponsor that we see here was the actual originating sponsor and then had the, uh, uh, a, a lama in a, a local monastery to, um, uh, to consecrate it. Now, um, not untypically, uh, we see that right next to or across from the... Uh, uh, the, the consecration, the altar table here and the two sponsors, we see two deities right next to them who are wealth deities. And I, I'm, these are, as you'll, as you'll see, very tiny. Uh, and so I'm sorry that the, the uh, images are not as clear as one would want them to be, but I hope it inspires you to go look at them uh, in, in person, as it were. But we see that... Um, that uh, the first figure there is um, uh, Yellow Jambala, a wealth deity. And this is, this is probably not accidental. Among the motivations uh, that uh, people have for sponsoring uh, such uh, paintings have to be worldly uh, kinds of, of motivations, including wealth, health, happiness, all, uh, things that need to be uh, that are required for also spiritual uh, work as well. So it's often the case, if you look closely at these um, sponsor figures, that they're very close to uh, wealth deities. Um, and, and we see uh, a, a larger example. And what, what identifies this as um, a wealth deity is um, the mongoose who is spitting out pearls. Well, this is a kind of convention uh, that uh, indicates a, uh, uh, the, the uh, acquisition of wealth. And I'm trying to point it to the right place, but here we go. There we go. And then the other uh, figure next to uh, Yellow Jambala is, um, is the black, so-called Black Jambala, who's uh, standing rather than, uh, than being seated. And he's also uh, carrying a, um, uh, a mongoose that is uh, spitting jewels. So again, it's um, uh, reinforcing the notion that uh, uh, pious activities will, in a sense, be rewarded um, with, uh, 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 with wealth. There we go. Stop. Um, and speaking of Padmasambhava, um, as Professor Mayer did uh, a moment ago, here we see an example in the um, exhibition. Now, so far, what, I, what I've shown you are um, mostly um, pretty straightforward, uh, not particularly specialized um, deities. All right, let me, let me go back here and, and reinforce that if I can. This is not, no, okay. Well, um, Padmasambhava is also a, something of a popular deity. Not a, not, although um, Nyingma practitioners would identify with him, specialists would identify with him, so would many other kinds of people uh, see him as, as a very important uh, cultural figure. And so in this case, we see, um, we see a, a, um, a uh, this is, Wow, it's going the wrong way. 
I, I, okay, so we see a, a, another couple, probably a wealthy, aristocratic couple, um, as the donors in the lower left. And um, uh, the, you'll notice that the, that the female figure has a child in her lap. So in a way, it's, it's the whole family who's involved in dedicating a, uh, a, a, a tanka like this to having it paid for. Um, and then on the other side, uh, we see a, another yellow jambala, a wealth deity. So we can assume that among the motivations, um, there are, um, there's piety, of course, but there's also a sort of generalized family feeling that we can, uh, we can all relate to uh, so that the benefits of making this are received uh, by a whole family and not just by um, the uh, one or the other um, member of the family. Okay, so then here's uh, another relatively uh, straightforward uh, example of a, a theme, and that's uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, which has uh, in the uh, donor tableau four figures. The two are, um, two of them are monks, and they're seated under an umbrella. Uh, and then uh, there are two other figures on the, on the right, and these appear to be lay figures. Between them is another table or altar, uh, which would, uh, you can see the, a, a little flame of, uh, of a lamp offering that would be made there. And then these are the other uh, kinds of things that would be used both in straightforward offerings and in what is called prana pratishtha or, or the consecration ritual, which the officiating lamas in Tucci's terms would, would, uh, would carry out. Uh, and then the, the main um, uh, sponsors are on the right. So this is the kind of thing that lay sponsors would have no um, uh, problem in a way um, uh, creating. There are, however, some uh, themes that we find exclusive to, uh, to specialists, uh, but these are not among them. Uh, another uh, extraordinary temp uh, painting in the uh, exhibition upstairs is a Garuda or a Kyung uh, uh, from and this is actually uh, an example where the provenance is um, is known uh, from the 16th century from Nako Monastery in Kinar, and it shows an aristocratic family. Um, the um, uh, of course our yellow jambala is on the far right, and and it's not always that the uh, sponsors are on uh, on the. They're almost always uh, in the lower portion. Sometimes they're on the right. Sometimes they're on the left. But it's often the case that they're on the lower left. But here we see a um, uh, a mixed sex family. The male holding the cup, and this is a, the gesture that's uh, associated with rulership. Um, so it may be a very aristocratic family. Um, and then another, uh, I believe, male figure here, a female figure, two female figures. This one is, is higher, uh, perhaps older. It's the main queen or the main um, lady. And then um, at least two children involved. So that the, uh, there's an extended family commitment. And we'll see later on that this is also the case um, in, in India as well when we look at at uh, Buddhist sculptures that families are involved. And it, it, we have to keep, uh, keep in mind that these are real people. Uh, these are not imagined ones. These are, are the people who are um, surely actually involved in making this for a host of reasons, including, including uh, straightforward religious piety, but for other, um, if we want, want to call them political reasons as well. So there we, we get a sense. and, and um, uh, there are offerings kind of outside the ritual space. The ritual space is decorated with um, um, hangings, uh, which create uh, a, a, dis, uh, a, a sort of um, make, sanctify the place where uh, the rituals are, are taking place and uh, separate them from ordinary space. They have a number of, um, of uh, uh, vessels I know in, in Ladakh and Zangskar, uh, there are representations of after a temple or a, or a uh, tanka is uh, consecrated, there's a kind of community feast. 
And we actually see, uh, as is common, in, uh, some um, uh, lambs or goats uh, beheaded um, who are um, part of, of a kind of offering here. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it suggests that, they're, they're, that although they represent an extended family, uh, if they were aristocratic, uh, they would actually sponsor larger feasts or banquets after um, the consecration of, of important um, uh, perhaps sets of paintings or donations made uh, to the monastery. Um, and uh, don't forget the ubiquitous yellow jambala um, wealth deity who's um, uh, spitting jewels into a, into a tray, uh, uh, suggesting uh, accumulation uh, but beneath the deity, but also immediately adjacent um, to the uh, uh, to the actual sponsors as well. Now, here, um, turning from um, examples where it was predominantly uh, lay or mixed lay and monastic sponsors to uh, paintings with uh, predominantly monastic sponsors. Um, we should be alert to uh, the, the idea that uh, the themes of the, of the, the main painting uh, are often dedicated to more specialized uh, knowledge. So that, for instance, Bhutan Rinchen Drup is an extremely important um, uh, cultural uh, progenitor in a way, um, but more to specialized uh, uh, specialists in the literature, uh, the Buddhist literature of Tibet, rather than uh, a, a kind of devotional figure like Padmasamava that is very widespread. So indeed, we, we don't find um, lay sponsors in, uh, in this example, assuming that this is, I mean, there's been some speculation about who this might be. Uh, whether it might be uh, Bhutan Rinchen himself, I, I don't think so. I think that this was probably, despite the halo, we've seen halos already on some of the other sponsor figures. It, it probably indicates that it's a, it's a sort of, at, at the moment, sanctified figure rather than a Buddha or Bodhisattva. But um, we see him uh, with a number of uh, other monks, uh, both participating in the rituals as well as witnessing the rituals. Uh, and so I would assume that this would be a, um, a monastic sponsor, either done for uh, their own shrine uh, in, their, uh, in their living quarters or else uh, for the, 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 whole, the entire monastery. So this is in a way, the monastery is sponsoring it. And so the abbot or the chief ritualist in the monastery would would then be involved in um, performing the ritual, and this was this was so such an important event um, that although if this is the consecration ritual, uh, it's obviously happening, or the representation of it is depicted before it actually happens, because that doesn't happen until the painting is completed. So this is a kind of predictive. Um, assurance or insurance that this is going to be uh, a, 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 a sanctioned uh, painting that has been consecrated and uh, you, can, you can depend on it and that's why uh, this is at the bottom. But it's, it's done by a monk rather than a, a layman because this um, honoring um, the, uh, one of the, the people who, who um, um, edited and compiled the, uh, one of the first major uh, canons um, um, at, at Shalu Monastery. This would be of more greater interest, if you will, um, to, uh, to specialists rather than to uh, general uh, lay people. I think, that's, I think that's accurate. And here's another one. Here's another, uh, a mandala. Uh, and a mandala is, is um, a representation of the kind of um, a technical practice that requires initiations and empowerments and is not, um, it's not that it's forbidden to lay people, but you would have to go through those and it's much more common as part of practice carried out 
um, by, uh, by monks in a monastery. And so, again, we see no lay donors, but we, we do see the, um, uh, the ritualist and the, the array of two altars or two low tables with um, torma, grain, sort of grain offerings, lamps, uh, incense, uh, water, a conch that might contain um, uh, fragrant oils, uh, and other kinds of objects. And even in a monastic context, we find this figure here. Um, and this is a, a slightly different version um, of, a, uh, of a wealth deity. It's Vaisravana riding on a lion. Uh, Again, a worldly protector who has the mongoose and who is spitting out jewels. Monasteries need wealth in order to carry out their duties as well uh, and to, to carry out um, uh, religious practices. So it's not confined just, uh, just to lay people that we would have uh, uh, the connections with the wealth. So all of these things are are worth paying attention to uh, in the tankas. They're, they're relatively small, uh, and you have to look closely, but they reward that, that kind of looking. There's quite a bit of information that's actually there. Um, speaking of Vaishravana, uh, as a wealth deity, this is another form of Vaishravana, the main theme. And, and then at the bottom is a, a depiction of uh, one of our sponsor consecrators, uh, and, and this time he's on the far right, uh, and he has he's in he's he is holding a, a long handled uh, brazier or incense burner, somewhat like the one that we saw uh, in one of the first slides. The the male layman was holding, but then he, in front of him are arrayed um, in a special uh, sacred space uh, that's sanctified. Uh, or signaled with a, with a um, baldachin uh, hanging on it. There are uh, tripod stands on which various offerings. So here's our familiar um, conch shell uh, right here. Uh, and it looks like possibly incense uh, sticks here. I, I'm not sure, but I could be misreading that. It, it is very small and, and faded. Uh, so, again, this is not just a, a mental offering, but a, a highly um, ritualized act that seems to be um, uh, related to uh, the consecration of the, of, the, of the tanka itself. Once it's consecrated, um, the deity is actually, as part of the consecration, invited into the painting and uh, asked to sort of bound there to stay at least as long as it uh, remains consecrated as long as possible. And then the tanka or the painting is considered to be um, uh, a, a real support uh, for the body, mind, and speech, or especially the body of the, of the deity. And so it is treated in a completely different way than an unconsecrated um, tanka. So as far as we're concerned, all of the tankas that are in, uh, on display have, in a sense, been deconsecrated. And they're no longer consecrated because the, the act of collecting them and, and publicly displaying them in, in this kind of an atmosphere, however respectful we all um, are, uh, I think would, would uh, be seen by most people as breaking that consecration. Um, so it was, a, it was a very important moment um, that needed to be signaled, apparently, um, to people. And that seems to be why, um, in so many of the uh, Tibetan paintings, uh, we do find consecrations, or, or representations of the consecration. So we don't find them in all paintings. And one of the reasons for that is that I, I think in a monastic or a shrine context, we would expect that all paintings would be consecrated, and sculptures as well. But um, paintings were often made in sets. And not each of the paintings of a set would have a consecration um, uh, or, a, a, or sponsor figure tableau in it, but only the last one or the first one would, would have um, the consecration. So when um, paintings become 
um, uh, sort of uh, dispersed, when sets of paintings become dispersed, a lot of times we, we don't realize, oh, uh, th this would have had a, a sponsor figure, but they sponsored the whole set and not the individual painting. Oops. Um, here's another example of a theme that um, requires rather specialized knowledge. Um, and, and so specialized that each one of these 84 Mahasiddhas, uh, except the central two, uh, at one time had a, uh, had a, a very tiny inscription um, uh, right uh, integrated into um, the, the scrolling like uh, design that, that connects them all. So if you look very, very carefully, um, many of them, or at least partially, uh, survive. Now, the 84 Mahasiddhas are models, uh, and it's, they're almost, they're, most of them are lay people themselves, but they're considered to be Indians who provided um, models with their lives of the efficacy of the teachings uh, so that they became uh, enlightened in their lifetime. And um, to, uh, Tibetans considered many of the teachings that they received uh, as coming in a lineage from these Mahasiddhas. And um, it's uh, the fact that there are 84 of them and all 84 are shown with, their, with uh, often little episodes from their distinctive lives um, and the, or their sort of enlightenment stories um, means that um, it's a specialized knowledge. And it's not that lay people are, are excluded from it, but, uh, and as I said, most of them are lay um, uh, persons themselves, but it is a more of a specialized uh, kind of knowledge um, to uh, maybe even a pedantic knowledge to know each one, uh, who each one is, and, and I'm very curious about that um, as an academic pedantic myself. Um, but we see then that there are no lay figures in this one as well. So there's a, there seems to be a kind of calibration that we can make historically in looking at these about when we see lay people and when we see don't. Now there are always exceptions. Uh, but um, uh, for the most part, it, it, it makes some sense um, uh, who is the sponsor of that. Uh, and so we see a, may, a main sponsor assisted in the rituals uh, by um, a, a specialist in the rituals and then a group of um, uh, monks, probably from the monastery for which it was made, uh, behind them, all intent on on this uh, on this important practice. Uh, um, so here again, we see a uh, this is a, um, a so-called tantric yidam, uh, chakrasamvara and Bajravarahi. Uh, and instead of seeing lay figures uh, as sponsors we see uh, uh, the Saraka, uh, at least uh, according to the early texts, like the Manjushri Milakalpa, that, that suggest uh, the way that a Saraka should sponsor his own painting, uh, his or her, and that uh, he or she should be um, depicted at the bottom, uh, in the bottom left, uh, and they should, be, they should be consecrating it. And so this is what we see. Now, in... Um, in, uh, in, in, because of the um, monasticization of Buddhism in, um, in Tibet, uh, we almost always see monks um, rather than uh, in India. We are, we, we'll see some examples of the officiating so-called, not lamas, um, they're actually lay practitioners um, who are involved. Um, but in, in Tibet, it's almost always monks. But this whole array of ritual objects that go beyond uh, merely a, um, a, a, a simple offering here. And um, this one was the, uh, this one is known to be because of an inscription found on it. Uh, yeah. It, it sometimes mixes up forward and backwards. I'm definitely pressing the back button, but there we go. 
um, there's a, a small inscription on it that indicates that this is fifth in the set of, of at least nine paintings. So it says it's the fourth right, and it starts at the center and goes left, right, left, right. So this is the fourth right. And uh, I assume then that that's probably uh, the only one with the sponsor inscription. So in a sense, it might be the, the last one or the one that uh, this particular practitioner had a special connection with and so um, placed uh, his portrait. I mean, you can imagine everybody makes a big donation and they want their name on the door. Uh, in the same way, these people are making um, these objects for their own practice and they, they want to have a personal connection to it and, um, in a sense, recognize themselves and, and have others uh, recognize their involvement as well. Now, there's some very interesting ones um, that, are, that are a little different. And that's, uh, there's a couple of Tucci paintings with sponsors who are actually receiving... Uh, in a very literal way, long life blessings. Uh, and so this is a fabulous painting. It's Amitaya sits on the cover. Deborah sele or whoever selected it to be the cover. It's a really important painting. Um, and we, we look at the bottom and, hey, where's the donor portrait? Uh, uh, well, they've actually been moved up. They've been elevated um, to the, uh, the panel that is as if it's a textile overhang uh, for, uh, off of the throne. And in Western Tibet especially, we find it a number of times that the, the artists utilize this as a, as a special kind of window um, that gives them an opportunity to do something a little different. Uh, and in this case, what they've done is they've placed the sponsor figures there. Um, in a way, it, it calls attention to them. And... Um, now, I'm sorry that it's so, it's so um, fuzzy, um, but I think you can see quite clearly that there are, um, there are lines that come down and connect these figures. Now, these figures are wearing white turbans, which is what the, um, the, the later uh, Gugge kings wore uh, that aligns them with the early uh, Tibetan empire. And uh, sort of as an insignia of their legitimate rule. Um, and so uh, Deborah has uh, identified them in the catalog as probably the Guge King Jigdin Wangchuk and his eldest son, um, Nagi Wangchuk. So this, this would be Jigdin Wangchuk. Um, but we see these lines coming down. Um, and this is going, it looks like it's going into the cup, or go, I assume it's coming down rather than coming up. Let's look at another, um, uh, a couple of other representations. We see that these lines are emanating from the vase uh, that Amitayas holds. Now, Amitayas is uh, the Tathagata Buddha of uh, long life. So, the fact that we see these lines coming out of his vase, and his vase, his bumpa, is filled with amrit, which is the nectar of immortality in a way. Um, and so we, we see it coming down, passing through, and sort of collecting more juice from the other representations of Amitya that are between the, the main one and, um, and the donors and then uh, flowing down uh, towards them. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, literalization of the blessings that are expected from sponsorship of, um, uh, 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 of in this case, the, the deity Amitayas himself, uh, who is uh, the, the most uh, logical bestower of, uh, of such a boon. But it's not the only one. So here's a, uh, let's see, did I, did I skip one or did it come back? No, I didn't skip one. Okay, this is Vajra Bhairava. Now this is a, uh, a very specialized deity, uh, another one of the Yidam uh, that, uh, that people need empowerments uh, in order to, um, uh, to practice uh, the visualization of, of Vajra Bhairava. This is so-called so solo uh, Vajra Bhairava without, uh, without his consort. And at the bottom uh, left, this is the sponsor inscription on the back that I uh, described earlier. 
may I, the monk, uh, Sonam Pazang, together with my relatives, by this assembly of deities around Vajrabhairava, achieve the highest and general accomplishments, or the siddhi. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking either this figure or this figure to be uh, Sonam Pazang and his relatives behind him. And notice that we see some of the same golden threads, these a bit more wavy, um, connecting them. And what are they connecting them with? Um, Amitayas, once again, up above. So even in a Vajrabhaira of a uh, painting, the idea that the, the notion of sponsorship could uh, result in uh, uh, the, the material blessings of long life or favorable rebirth um, is, uh, is nascent and, and even when it's not so literally depicted, I think we can assume that uh, some of that sometimes is, uh, is going on. So this is, a, again, uh, just a minor little, uh, this is a fabulous painting. You go up and see it, and you're overwhelmed by the power of the main figure. Don't, don't f- neglect uh, the f- scenes at the bottom, which are, um, are also um, very, very intriguing. Now, this is, uh, I've worked on this before, uh, and um, here's a painting probably from the same, uh, from, from uh, Ngari, uh, that, that also shows... Uh, a similar theme, uh, and um, uh, with Amitayas directly ab- below Mahakala, but directly above lay figures, a woman with a child, and apparently it's a female child because it seems to have a parak, uh, and, and monks, and a, um, a monk with a mirror who's um, uh, consecrating this, all of this should look familiar to you now, and now you know how to decode these uh, images uh, when you see them upstairs. Um, and I, there's, uh, there's also some examples, uh, murals in a cave site known as uh, Tsaparang, and I've discussed them in, uh, um, elsewhere. Now, um, in the time that I have left, um, I would like to, to show uh, some of the connections to uh, earlier Indian sculpture representations of sponsors, and uh, it, so how am I doing? Okay, I'll I'll be sure I can do that. Um, I want I want to point out a few things that uh, both physical objects as well as uh, or general orientations that can be related. For instance, this is, a, this is an Orissan sculpture, um, uh, and it shows a, uh, an officiating um, acharya, vajracharya, here uh, on, the far, on, on the far right, and a whole family, right? A male, a, a, a child, probably a male child, and three females behind them. Uh, so they, too, are uh, very much involved in, uh, in the sponsorship. And where is it? Uh, low, bottom uh, left. What kinds of postures uh, do they make? Uh, one's familiar to us already. Of course, the, the clothes that they wear are local, um, but, the, but the attitudes that they take uh, in reverence uh, to the, to the, the Buddhist uh, themes are, are very similar. This is also a kind of a local adaptation, but um, you, you get the idea. Um, and even in India, both um, uh, Buddhist and Brahmanical themes have uh, nearly identical examples. So here's a family uh, at the bottom of the Vishnu uh, sculpture that I just showed you. Uh, make, uh, ho- the male is holding a garland, but the whole family uh, is involved. So, um, and here is a beautiful um, uh, Avalokiteshvara sculpture that shows an individual monk. Uh, kneeling the, the sponsor figure, um, offering a, um, a flower, as, as we have seen. And uh, we can find uh, ident- nearly identical details of, uh, of monks in uh, early, early Tibetan uh, examples as well. Now, here's an interesting one, uh, a Parvati. So again, a Brahmanical um, example but that shows a... A Vajracharya-like or a sadakacharya um, with a book 
very much like the Buddhist ones. But what I wanted to point out here is that these are uh, royal figures. The, the parasols above them indicate that this is a, this is a king, um, a, a local king, uh, with uh, uh, two of his, um, uh, of his consorts. And uh, this can be related to uh, the kings who, who have little parasols above them uh, in the Gugge case um, as well. So aristocrats are very much involved in, in the uh, um, uh, production of these I- images in, on both sides of the Himalayas. I wanted to also point out one example of some of the m- several types of ritual objects that we find in eastern India also shows up in Tibet, including these tripod, um, these tripod vases. Um, which we saw in this example, uh, and they're they're quite specific. They're wavy legged or wavy shouldered, um, and, and uh, it seems that they were indeed um, transmitted. Thank you uh, to the. Um, uh, this is from the example that you already saw. This is from uh, Eastern India, and we see them in Alchi as well, uh, in w- the Western Himalayas in mural paintings, um, and we actually find examples of them in in Tibet. Uh, so not necessarily literally transported from India, uh, but uh, they must have seen either paintings or uh, small examples, because these are not described with s- such specific detail in any of the, of the ritual texts that would have been transmitted. So just a f- couple other examples where you can see an Eastern Indian array of ritual objects um, as part of a consecration ritual depiction, and in the same thing in, in Tibet as well. Thank you. Um, and uh, these, these are more examples. So, um, of course, there's more to say about this, uh, about the particular artistic and religious conventions and practices in Buddhist centers of Bihar and Bengal between the 8th and 12th uh, or the 13th century, as well as the adaptation by Tibetan painters of conventions of placement of the sponsor, the officiating lamas, their postures, their gestures, and the material implements used in rituals of consecration and offering. And so my, I, I'm trying to suggest that there's, that there's a connection between the early uh, images uh, and imagery. And if I succeeded in demonstrating that what appears on stone sculptures in eastern India, which surely did not travel in significant numbers and scale over the Himalayas, is to an extent mirrored by paintings in Tibet and the Western Himalayas, then I hope it's not stretching a point to uh, suggest that the greater detail found in the paintings in in Tibet probably reflect the type of paintings that originally were found in Eastern India but but no longer um, survive. Uh, So although we rarely know much about the intended uh, recipients of these so-called donations, the particular shrines where they were hung, uh, in, in Eastern India, whether they were in village temples or regional pilgrimage shrines, um, surely the honor, the status, and the spiritual merit earned by these acts were not monopolized by a single individual, wh- whether or not they are named in the inscriptions or depicted on the lower border of the painting. Like the sponsors of Indian sculptures, within the larger communities in which these works were made, among neighbors and descendants who could use these images as foci of their own devotion. The esteem owed to the original sponsors was shared by members of their households writ large. And I believe the sharing of the wealth of spiritual and cultural capital is implied when the extended families, including the children, uh, are depicted as some of the examples in the present exhibition demonstrate. The issues discussed and, oh, go back. One more. Go forward. There we go. The issues discussed and my preliminary conclusions justify, I hope, the concentrated attention to sponsor figures, these minor elements on a lower on the lower periphery of religious sculptures. This esteem for the insignificant, as Walter Benjamin phrased it, also rewards the contemporary viewer with long neglected but charming idealized portraits of a cavalcade of forgotten beings. After all, what animates this esteem, if not the willingness to push forward uh, research to the point where even the insignificant, no, precisely the insignificant, becomes significant. Thank you very much.
Sorry for the... Thank you so much for another um, engaging and informative paper uh, from this morning. I think that we can... Um, we'll, we'll start a little bit later uh, this afternoon, so let's just... T maybe we can take one or two questions um, here in the front first. Thanks. No, 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 please don't say that. Um, thanks. This is a really terrific, exciting presentation. I've long been interested in these kind of donor figures, and I really appreciate your suggestion to actually pay attention to them in this really careful reading. But I, I wanted to, to, and I'm kind of thinking through this question as I ask it, so I hope there's a question. Um, I wanted to ask you about your use of the term consecration, and kind of distinguishing between figures making offerings and figures carrying out a kind of ritual activity because the question then is what's consecrating what? Are they actually representations of those figures, the monks presumably, consecrating the central image? And if so, that kind of belies the fact that to create a powerful consecrated image requires human intervention. And in a sense, the juice is flowing upward from the patron to the central figure instead of the other way around. Or is there another possible reading? I'm just wondering how you, how you think about that. Oh, great. Well, there's always another possible reading. Um, and, I, and I'm open to it. You know, I, I haven't, uh, I, I've just been, uh, I'm in the process of, of working through this material. I think because I don't see the flow except with examples with Amitayas, if it was a more generalized uh, consecration uh, flow, then uh, you would see it with others. Uh, but uh, so I, I, my preferred reading, but uh, is that it's flowing down. That it's an example of sort of light being, being sent. Um, as far as the um, the consecration itself, well, I mean there are svayambu uh, things that don't need consecration uh, that are self-manifested uh, images, but. Um, in my in my own sort of uh, limited fieldwork experience, mainly in Zangskar, I've just seen the amazing uh, different differential in the treatment of objects if they have been uh, consecrated and or then deconsecrated. And and if they've been deconsecrated, it's like a light switch goes off. They treat them. I mean, they don't you know spit on them or anything like that. But it's just it's a different category of fish. And so uh, I think consecration uh, is, is a very important part. And that it's not, um, I mean, of course, the painter was working, the Vajrabhairava is not consecrated. It's, it's not a, a deity before it's consecrated. So, but he's still painting it, so it's, it's a projection. Uh, and they treat, the artists treat him uh, respectfully. They say prayers, and they do a series of sort of mini consecrations along the lines. But... Um, the, the consecration, the final one, uh, is the one I think that is being, that I read this as being depicted, because that's the one that counts uh, for, for the longest. And, and the, the, one of the final, um, one of the final uh, stages in the big consecration is that the, the officiating lama or, or sit, Vajracharya will ask the sponsors to come up and make the first offering. So the first offering is part of the consecration ritual. So I, I, in my reading of it, I can accommodate the, um, uh, the sponsor figures, the lay sponsor figures, for example, as making offerings, um, but, that, but that still doesn't, doesn't negate the idea that, that what is the larger, um, the larger thing that's being um, hammered home is that these then will be consecrated. Um, so I, I hope that addresses Thank you, it. wise Professor Lynn Roth. <laughs> um, let's, let's take just one more question. And for the, the rest of you who have, who have questions, I want to remind everybody that there's, uh, there's an extra opportunity to ask everybody questions at the end of the day. Okay. Hello. I was just wondering, um, a Geshe once told me that sometimes string is used in consecration rituals, like between a cupola and an actual, uh, the object being consecrated. And I'm wondering if there's a parallel between the Dutsi coming from the um, Bumpa in the paintings yeah, yeah. that we're looking no, at. I, in the... I, I, I think there is, there is definitely a parallel. I mean, I, that goes back to the 
I mean, famously in Buddhist studies uh, in Japan, uh, where it, it, part, one version of the consecration ritual is, is the opening of the eyes. Uh, and you can look at, at Donald Swear's um, Becoming the Buddha, where he talks about how it, it, there are st- strings attached to the Buddha uh, and everybody holds on to them uh, during the final consecration rituals. And, and in Japan, in the um, 8th century, when the big Buddha was consecrated, supposedly these uh, golden ropes were, at- were uh, uh, attached to the brushes that the... Um, uh, I think the artist uh, on top of the big Buddha uh, at Todaiji was uh, was actually manipulating, but they were held by the hands of the emperor um, to to connect him, the emperor who'd really um, uh, created that thing. So, so yeah, I, th- I think in in Buddhist contexts, this is not a a unique uh, situation, and there are a number of possible parallels to that. Um, so that makes sense. What what he told you. <laughs> 